Hofbrau Oktoberfest Bier. Welcome to another edition of Bands, Bikes and Booze Reviews. Now, just in case you thought I didn't read your comments, I do. And I had, just before I started this video, I had a comment from someone who was watching this with his missus. And uh, his missus said about me, uh, what is it? My partner here listening with me to your review, lol. She says, and I quote, Jeez, he's worse than an old woman. All he does is moan. <laughs> yeah, and... And don't call me Alf Garnet for nothing. Bitch, you Peruvian punch, you! Anyway, less about Alf Garnet, more about this beer. Now, this is the Hof, Hofbräu, I should say, Oktoberfest beer. Now, I do recall this being an absolutely fantastic beer, and full disclosure, I have tried this this year in that little Oktoberfest box. I will get rid of it one day, but it was... In amongst all this lot, the, in the Wiesen Tragel, as they call it, where is it? It's there. And it was good. In fact, it was very good. But I have to say, it wasn't the best in that box. I preferred the Mertzen. Now, I don't think this is a Mertzen. This is more of a, a light colour, more in keeping with a Bock style beer than it is with a Mertzen, and Mertzen, of course, it was the tradition up until the early 70s, and then they uh, moved away from it, and now, I wouldn't say more or less anything goes, but you, you do tend to find that a lot of the beers are light in colour, almost like Helles's. But Hofbrau, of course, one of the big six from Munich, as they are known, and they are probably, I would wager, they are one of the biggest, along with maybe Paulana as well. But Hofbrau, believe it or not, they have a franchise and uh, other Hofbrau houses uh, are opened up in various parts of Germany. So there's one in Berlin, there's one in Hamburg, and there's one in Bremen. But there's also one in Australia. There's a number of them in the United States. There's one in Korea, in Seoul. There's even one in Dubai as well, that hellhole in the desert, that, that turd rolled in glitter that they call Dubai. There's even one there as well, and they're franchises, so I'm assuming they just sell Hofbrau beer. As you can imagine, I well, I would imagine they're quite popular. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But they do exist, anyway. And uh, there's quite a lot to get through in this video, so I'm not going to dawdle too much. I'll give you a little bit about the brewery. They've been going since uh, 1589. They are state-owned. They're owned by the state of Bavaria. Um, if you're not aware... Um, Germany was is well is made up of uh, different states, and uh, Bavaria is a little bit well they call it the free state of Bavaria. It's a little bit of a, a misnomer. They have their own laws. They even have their own police force as well. So if ever you fly into Munich or Nuremberg or any of them, Augsburg or wherever, you'll see normal uh, Polizei, German Polizei, but you'll also see the Bavarian state police as well. And you can recognise them because they've got a shield on their um, on their shoulder with the uh, the, the bark coat of arms it's basically you know the blue and white check but yeah they're a, a bit of a, a, a sort of a misnomer in germany but the hofbrau uh, brewery has got a very rich history indeed there has a lot to do with the traditions of oktoberfest they were commissioned by uh, maximilian i think his name or prince maximilian to brew the beer for oktoberfest but there's a little bit of history going before that as well. As you know, sometimes I talk about the Thirty Years' War. Very, very... It doesn't mean much to uh, us Brits, but in Europe, and especially Germany, and especially Sweden as well, um, it means quite a lot because it was a very, very destructive war. 
especially for Germany and especially for the state of Bavaria. And um, Munich was threatened um, to be destroyed basically by King Gustavus, who was the king of the Swedes at the time who had waged the Thirty Years' War. And uh, he, yeah, he threatened to raise Munich to the ground unless uh, a certain amount of hostages, a few hundred thousand hostages. And they also had to give them, um, I think it was 600,000 barrels of Hofbrau beer as well. He knew what he was doing. But yeah, 30, 30 years war, very, very destructive period in European history. Thankfully, not for us Brits though. We were too busy fighting our own civil war at the time. Anyway, more on that later. Um, 1920s. Another bit of history for you, um, Hitler. You remember the, the one bollocked Charlie Chaplin lookalike? He uh, announced the plans of the Nazi party in the Hofbräuhaus House in 1920. And a year later in 1921, he was announced in the Hofbräuhaus. House, he was allowed, allowed, spit it out, get your teeth in. He was announced leader of the Nazi party in 1921 in the Hofbräuhaus. House. So there is quite a bit of history. And if you look at the, the, the early history of the Nazi party, especially in the 20s, there is a, a lot of history that's evolved around the, um, the the beer kellers at the time. And obviously the Hofbräu that I've just mentioned, Hofbräu House, but the Löwenbräu beer keller, that's where the uh, beer keller putsch took place, where he basically tried to seize power. But yeah, um, not going to bore you with too much uh, history on there. Needless to say, Munich did suffer quite a lot of bomb damage and it was occupied by the Americans after the war. And it did become a tourist attraction because a lot of American GIs would go home with a lot of souvenir, souvenirs, I should say, with the HB logo on there. And uh, when uh, when people came back to Germany to visit Munich, they went to the Hofbräuhaus because they had um, cups and um, glassware in their um, in their homes in America, which had been brought back from the United States, uh, brought back to the United States, I should say. So that's a sort of a, a very potted history of the Hofbrau uh, Brewery. Uh, needless to say, it's state owned and uh, it remains state, state owned to this day. So I want to get on to the next section because helpfully Hofbrau have given me a full brew sheet and I want to explain what's in these beers and it'll also give you an indication of what's in German beers in general. So let's stop gassing and let's get on to the next section. Right, 500ml bottle, 6.3%. I think I made a mistake in the Augustina um, ABV. I said it was 6.1, it was actually 6.3. I do apologise. Uh, there is the um, genuine Bavarian product. If this fucking auto focus, do your job. There you go. And uh, the brew sheet I was going to mention. Now, thankfully, they do give a full list of the hops that are in here. So I'm going to run through the hops and give you a brief explanation of what they are. Hercules hops are in here. They can they can be used as a bittering hop. Unfortunately, I don't know what the bittering hop in is, is, the, is in this because they use quite a lot of dual hops in this beer. There's, uh, there's five um, hops, sorry, there's four hops in this beer. Uh, first one is Hercules. That can be used as a bittering hop, but it's also f uh, spicy. It can be known to be tangy and some people get melon flavours from it as well. There's also um, a distinct pine note on there as well. But it's uh, it's a very um, strong flavoured, it's a descendant of the Halatau Taurus hop and it inherits a lot of the characteristic characteristics from that hop. Hercules, they use it in also in quite a few of the vice beers that are on the market but from various brewers. Now you've got, her, um, I assume all these beers all these beers, all these hops are grown in the Halatau region, as you would imagine. Um, the next hop in the, that's used in here is Perla hops. That's the most popular aroma hop that's used in Germany. And there is 3,000 hectares dedicated to growing that every year. And um, it's it's got a flavour profile to it as well. Um, it's quite earthy and woody as well. Um, there's also a distinct note of black pepper in that too. So that's what it is renowned for and they've used it in here so there should be notes of that in there as well magnum hops now magnum sounds american doesn't it remember that mustachioed fucking pi whatever his name was tom Selleck, that's his name it's not named after him right and it's not an american hop it's not named after the gun it's 
Originally, it was a German hop. Well, is it named after the gun or the the PI? It, it, it was invented, well, it, it came out in 1980 and it originated in Germany and it's a bittering hop. You see it quite a lot in IPAs, American style IPAs. You see it a lot in, in American pale ales and I imagine a lot of West Coast IPAs as well. And it's used as the bittering hop. It also has subtle citrus flavors in it as well, but it's main, mainly used for its alpha acid content and the bittering hops, as a bittering hop, I should say. The next one, the last one that's used in here is the Halatau Select. Now Halatau Select is basically Halatau Mittel through or Halatau Tradition. And that's ubiquitous in German beers. If you've tasted a German beer, I'm almost certain you've tasted what a Halatau Mittel through Tradition, Select, whatever you want to call it, what that tastes like. Unfortunately, the Mittel through is, is on the wane at the moment. It's very prone to wilt and it's very prone to mildew as well. And the uh, tradition, well, the select, the tradition, whatever you want to call it, that has been developed to withstand these ailments that the middle through has, such as wilt and the mildew. This, again, has big flavors of earth, grass. When I say grass, I mean, you know, that hay type flavor that you get in really good German beers. That's where that's coming from. It also has nectar fruits as well, so like a peach, that type of thing. That that's some of the the known flavours that you get from that hop. Now the water in this beer, it comes from their own wells. They're 150 metres down in the ground in Germany, and of course they are fresh spring water wells that give you very very pure water indeed which is an essential ingredient probably the most important ingredient in brewing a lager i will say that and it's probably why we can't get it right in this country and don't worry i'm not going to start whinging about that so mate i can't remember your name but you uh, you tell your missus i do i, I can control myself fucking hell she don't want to see my uh, brew dog videos jesus christ anyway uh what else have we got we've got the malt there's light barley malt in there which is just the base malt that they've used in there. I imagine it's got a, a reasonable malty flavour. But you've also got Munich malt as well, which is in there, and that adds body to the beer, gives it a quite a, a strong malty note. Would you believe that's Munich malt? You would think it was only used in pale lagers and, and German beers. It's very, very good for English ales and bitters, and it's used quite a bit. Interesting. Didn't know that. Learned that today. So there you go. Just a little tidbit of information here. Hofbrau use 6,000 6, tonnes of malt every year to make their beers. That's a hell of a lot of fucking malt. 6,000 tonnes. Wow. And that's just one brewery. So you can imagine in Bavaria, there's a lot of farms that are growing malt. And you can see that, you know, I, I just went to a small part of Franconia and it was totally rural, total, totally farmland. And it was just, it looked like wheat fields that were there. So, yeah. Interesting, and they use eight different malt suppliers as well. So I imagine, you know, with 6,000 tons of malt, or sorry, six, yeah, 6,000 tons of malt, you're gonna need more than one supplier, and they use eight, which is um, interesting if you're a beer nerd like me. So, without further ado, let's get this open, and let's see what's going on. I will show you the cap as if you hadn't seen the cap before you can get Hofbrau Hellas now in in Morrison's they do it in the larger Morrison's I often uh, drink it or oh, it's often one of my fridge fillers when I'm shopping for beer certainly when it comes to lager it's either this or Budvar or some of the they do a Kirsch as well that Fru Kirsch in Morrison's. And uh, yeah, I'll occasionally pick up some of that as well. Right, there it is. I've totally fucking ruined that with that size head. But what are we getting on the nose? Oh, lovely. Oh yeah, and, and there you go immediately. The earthiness springs to mind. Now you've got quite a few hops with that, that nice earthy flavor. There's almost, there's a very perfumey floral note on that as well. which is nice. It complements it quite well. And that earthiness is just lovely. It's very big. And there's also some of them 
multi, sweet multi notes that are in there too. Nice. And there it is in the glass, as, you, as I said before, it is very light indeed. And I'm starting to think now that the low carbonation is a, is a trait of Oktoberfest beer for some reason, because I've had three now, the Hackershaw, no sorry, not the Hackershaw, the Augustina, the, the Hofbrau that I'm drinking now, and the Lervenboy as well, all three had very, very low levels of carbonation. I'm wondering whether that's so you can drink more, it doesn't, it's not too gassy and it doesn't bloat you out because at the end of the day, when you're at the Oktoberfest, all you wanna do is get absolutely effing well mullered. But I digress. Let's get it down my fat Gregory Peck. Zum Wohl, as they say in Germany. Oh. Nice. Mm, there's a long finish on that as well. That's really nice. I'll just put a little bit more in there, just to give you more of an indication of the colour. Now, first, first mouthful, slight, slight bitterness on that. I'm wondering whether that's the, maybe a bit of sort of a, a bit of ethanol that's on there. And it's 6.3%. That wouldn't surprise me. There was a, there was a little hint of that as well, yesterday on the Augustina from the first mouthful. So. Let me take another mouthful, get my uh, palate adjusted. It's really nice. There's huge, malty, bready notes on the finish. But there's a, there's a real complex flavour going on on the palate. Now, I got this out just before I started doing my research. So this is, I wouldn't say it's, it, it, this is just chilled. So there's a hell of a lot more flavor coming through on here and it's really complex. And I'm gonna try and dissect exactly what I'm getting on there. Right, there's a very slight piney note on that, which is giving it its, its bitterness. And there's also what I'm sort of translating as being like a very bitter citrus note on that as well. Very subtle, these, these flavors are very subtle. So if you're drinking this and you're wondering what the hell he's going on about, these flavors are very subtle. There's a fair amount of spice on that too, black pepper type spicy notes which I think is probably adding to the bitterness as well. However, the finish is very sweet. It's got lovely malty, um, bready malt type notes on that finish, but the finish is big. And this is quite full bodied as well. And there's, a, there's a definite pine, floral note on this too. Pine, floral, spicy, um, earthy as well. Bitterness on the backbone too. And then the finish is just that liquid bread coupled with quite earthy notes too. It does make for a, a nice beer, very complex as well. Now it's not as easy drinking as the Augustina and it's a lot more complex than the Augustina. Um, it's a lot more bitter than the Augustina, and it's certainly a lot more bitter than the Lervenboy, which, in my opinion, wasn't that great. It's probably the weakest one out of the Munich ones I've tried so far. I've got one left to do, that is the Spartan. I'll be doing that tomorrow. I may even do it tonight, I don't know. But I'll be doing that tomorrow or tonight, and it'll be up on the channel soon, so that'll be me done with the Oktoberfest beers. But let's dive in again.
yeah, it's nice. It's nice. However, the bitterness on there is big. And if you're comparing it to the Augustina, I would say that the Augustina is just, it's like liquid gold. It just goes down so easily. This one, I imagine at a colder temperature, you're not gonna get a lot of these flavors that I'm talking about. So if you're watching this and you do manage to get hold of some of this stuff, or you have tried it, um, just be mindful that I've drunk this, not freezing cold, just chilled. And it's probably why I'm getting a lot more of them flavors. So you, if you've tried this at a slightly lower temperature, you're probably not gonna get them flavors. But it's nice, all the same. Quite complex, which I like. Again, the bitterness is there. Big earthy notes, bready malt, spice as well. Um, all in all, that is not a bad attempt at all. So, what is the verdict on the Hofbrau Oktoberfest beer? Hofbräu. Oktoberfest beer, I should say. Uh, in a word, yes, very nice indeed. This isn't the run of the mill, love and bright attempt, and this isn't the liquid gold Augustina attempt. I wouldn't say it's somewhere in the middle. This is definitely not on the lower end of the scale. This is good. However, I think personal preference, and I think probably a lot of you viewers as well are probably going to enjoy the Augustina more than you're gonna enjoy, enjoy the Hofbräu attempt. This is nice, it's got a lot of complex, complex flavors compared to the Augustina. There's a lot more bitterness on this one as well, in a good way, I'm not saying it's bad, but there's a lot more earthy notes, there's a lot more of the spiciness and a lot more of the bitterness. So there really is some hop character and you'd expect that as well because they've got four different types of hop in there and you really do get that cross section of all them hops that they've put in there, especially the Hercules hops. Now, the Hercules hops are, they're a bitter in hop as well, as is the Magnum. I would imagine, judging by the bitterness, and I could be wrong on this, but I would imagine that they've used the Magnum as the bitter in hop. And the Hercules, Hercules is a, I, th I think, a dual purpose hop, so you can use it for bittering, you can use it for aroma as well but the two of them combined do have bitter notes and it does translate into the flavor now if you're a fan of hefty um well abv is quite high on this as well it's 6.3 so if you're a fan of quite hefty flavors quite hefty hoppy flavors and when i say hoppy i don't mean the american style hop i mean the the, the noble style hop flavor and you're a fan of quite high ABV beers, you're gonna enjoy that. However, if you're just in for a beer that's chugging and you want the minimal amount of fuss, I would say go with the Augustina. For that reason, and for personal taste as well, I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it a nine out of ten. Now it is really nice, don't get me wrong. However, I think the Augustina for me this year tops it off. If you look at my previous review of this beer, I think it was about three years ago, possibly less, I put this as the best Oktoberfest beer of the time. And oh, that just goes to show how much my palate has changed in between reviewing it first time round and the second time round. This for me isn't the great, <clears throat> the great beer that I thought it was three years ago. I think the Augustina has surpassed it in pure, in just drinkability, uh, smoothness, and refreshment, of course, but also just it, it just the flavour, the balance, of all them elements is just bang on. Whereas this, yeah, you're getting a hell of a lot of hot character on that. That may not be to everyone's taste. I quite like it, I do, and that's why I'm giving it a nine out of ten. However, I just think the Augustina pips it to the post. So there you go. And remember, beer is working class champagne.